All right, thrill seekers. I want to show you the most zen t-shirt I've ever owned. So today, oh, uh, new stuff on my blog, new stuff on my podcast. Go check out the blog and podcast. Blog is at hardcorezen.info. Podcast is called Hardcore Zen Podcast, and you can find it wherever there are podcasts to be found. Okay, today I want to talk to you about a book I just finished uh, just minutes ago. This is called Helgoland by Carlo Rovelli. And I've mentioned Carlo Ro Rovelli uh, before because I read his book, The Order of Time, recently. And that's what uh, got me excited about this one. This is the newest book he's written. Quite a thin little book. But what I like about it is it's probably the closest thing I've ever seen from a physicist to kind of getting the Buddhist perspective on the nature of reality. Uh, same with his order of time on, on the nature of time. And the point of the book is to discuss quantum mechanics, I don't know, quantum physics. And quantum physics is one of those things everybody gets wrong, especially people in what I reluctantly refer to as my profession. You know, you've got that uh, that terrible movie, What the Bleep Did We... What the Bleep Do We Know? Um, God, uh, the, the secret goes into it. A lot of Buddhist teachers try to delve into the waters of quantum physics without really understanding it. Uh, you know, occasionally I'll make a nod to it here and there, but I don't really understand it. But Rovelli, I think probably as much as anybody can understands it, at least in terms of the mathematics, and he makes his efforts to explain it in as clear and concise a fashion as he can, and it's pretty short, as I said. Uh, so I made a bunch of notes in the back that I'm just going to tell you about, and uh, this, is, this is how I do with books. I've been introducing people to my system with books, so here I'll introduce it to you. Uh, instead of marking up the book with, um, you know, highlights and stuff, I write little notes in the back of uh, just where to find the bits I want. They're, that way, the book itself remains relatively clean, and then the you know the chat, the page in the back gets all messed up. So let me uh, just pick out a few of these things I picked up. One of the things that I found very interesting in this book was his discussion of the philosophy of Ernst Mach who I had not heard of, who was apparently very influential on a lot of the understanding that came to be known as quantum physics. He says, Mach, a scientist, diverts this attention from the subject to experience itself to what he calls sensations. And he basically says that our knowledge of the world is really our knowledge of sensations, which is something that Nishijima Roshi used to say a lot in his own way, which is that what we call matter are is actually sensations in our sense organs. Uh, that's how he would put it. Uh, I always wanted to go even a little bit further and say that our sense organs, the, the knowledge or the idea that we have sense organs is also a sensation in our sense organs, you know. So we're, we're getting really abstract there. But, um, but that's, that's one thing that I found interesting. Also, he quotes Bertrand Russell, who says, uh, The raw material out of which the world is built up is not of two sorts, one matter and the other mind. It is simply arranged in different patterns by its interrelations. Some arrangements may be called mental, while others may be called physical. Another thing that uh, really sounds like Buddhism there. Uh, matter and mind are not two distinct things. They're a, they're a continuum. Uh, this reminds me of... Shobogenzo, my old favorite, uh, a chapter called Sokushin Zebutsu, or as my teacher calls it, Mind Here and Now is Buddha. And this is a difficult chapter of Dogen, and in Sokushin Zebutsu, Mind Here and Now is Buddha, Dogen says, An ancient patriarch said, What is fine, pure, and bright mind? It is mountains, rivers, and the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So mind, matter are the same thing. Clearly, mind is mountains, rivers, and the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
But what these words say is when we are moving forward not enough and when we are drawing back too much. And he's kind of cautioning us against taking any extreme views like mind is matter or matter is mind. No, same thing. Mind, matter are the same thing. Mind as mountains, rivers, and the earth is nothing other than mountains, rivers, and the earth. There are no additional waves or surf, no wind or smoke. Mind as the sun, the moon, and the stars is nothing other than the sun, the moon, and the stars. There is no additional fog or mist. A mind as living and dying, coming and going is nothing other than living, dying, and coming and going. There is no additional delusion or realization. Mind as fences, walls, tiles, and pebbles is nothing other than fences, walls, tiles, and pebbles. There is no additional mud or water. And he kind of goes on in that same uh, way for a while and kind of makes his point that when we say mind, uh, mind is sun, moon, the stars, we are meaning the stars as they are, not as in, in an abstract way, but in the concrete way that they really are. And... He says, the mind that has been authentically transmitted means one mind as all dharmas and all dharmas as one mind. Now, our friend Mr. Rovelli has something to say about that. Again, referring to Mach, he says, he, Mach, uses the term elements in a similar, in a sense similar to Dhamma in Buddhist philosophy. Elements are not just the sensations that a human being or an animal experiences, they are any phenomena that manifest, it's, ah, manifest themselves in the universe. The elements are not independent, they are tied by relations, what Mach calls functions, and these are what science studies. So he gets into how everything is interrelational and nothing has an independent existence in and of itself, not even subatomic particles. Everything is interrelational and exists by its relation to other things. And he even has a whole chapterlet, not an entire chapter, about Nagarjuna. So let's see what I made a note of that he says about Nagarjuna. If every metaphysics seeks a primary substance, an essence on which everything may depend, the point of departure from which everything follows, Nagarjuna suggests that the ultimate substance, the point of departure, does not exist. There are timid intuitions in a similar direction in Western philosophy, but Nagarjuna's perspective is radical. Conventional everyday existence is not negated. On the contrary, it is taken into account in all of its complexity with its levels and facets. It can be studied, explored, analyzed, and reduced to more elementary terms, but there is no sense, Nagarjuna argues, in looking for an ultimate substratum. The difference from contemporary structural realism, for instance, seems clear. I can imagine Nagarjuna adding a short chapter to a contemporary edition of his book entitled All Structures Are Empty. They exist only when you are thinking about organizing something else. In his terms, they are neither precedent to objects nor not precedent to objects. Neither are they both things, nor ultimately neither one nor the other. And he kind of goes on with that, and I found that uh, very interesting as well. And here's a bit I liked. Perhaps it is difficult to imagine how we as human beings may be made up of only tiny stones bouncing against each other, but tiny stones meaning atoms and, and you know, sub-atoms. But look that closely, a stone is a vast world, a galaxy of swarming quantum entities where probabilities and interactions fluctuate. And he kind of goes on and on. Uh, he gives a really good explanation for why the many worlds hypothesis is just kind of a, a retrograde trying to reintroduce the the concept of matter uh, as an independent substance back into the equation after you've already gotten rid of it through the quantum mechanical stuff and I wish I could explain that one to you because I got a friend who's really interested in that and I'd like to explain to him but I think you'd have to read the whole darn book to get it. Another thing that I found interesting kind of goes along with something I read in talks with Sri Ramana Maharshi which kind of mm, stuck in my mind and I read this out to the group in Benedictushof so if you go to my podcast and listen to the I believe it's in the third episode of the uh, talks about Hyakujo's fox uh, I read this quote he says uh, 
somebody says to um, Ramana Maharshi, seeking the eye, there is nothing to be seen. And Mahar Ramana Maharshi answers, because you are accustomed to identifying yourself with the body and sight with the eyes, you say you do not see anything. But what is there to be seen? Who is to see? How to see? There is only one consciousness which manifesting as I thought identifies itself with the body, projects itself through the eyes, and sees objects around. The individual is limited in the waking state and expects to see something different. The evidence of his senses will be the seal of authority, but he will not admit that the seer, the seen, and sight are all manifestations of the same consciousness, namely I, I. Contemplation helps one overcome the illusion that the self must be visual. In truth, nothing visual exists. How do you feel the I now? Do you hold a mirror in front of you and know your own being? The awareness is the I. Realize it, and that is the truth. So that's real interesting, because he, uh, Carlo Rovelli, uh, devotes a chapter to, or a, a part of a chapter to visual systems. How do we see? How do we know that what we have in front of us is a book or a cat? A book, look, and a dog over there, no cat. And where did the dog go? Well, anyway, I'll show him later. It would seem natural to think that the receptors detect the light that reaches the retinas of our eyes and transforms it into signals that race to the interior of the brain where groups of neurons elaborate the information in ever more complex ways until they interpret it and identify the objects in question. Uh, blah, blah, blah and uh, recognize it as it's a cat. It turns out, however, that the brain does not work like this at all. It functions, in fact, in the opposite way. Many, if not most, of the signals do not travel from the eyes to the brain. They go the other way, from the brain to the eyes. What happens is that the brain expects to see something on the basis of what it knows and has previously occurred. The brain elaborates an image of what it predicts the eyes should see. This information is conveyed from the brain to the eyes through intermediate stages. If a discrepancy is revealed between what the brain expects and the light arriving into the eyes, only then do the neural circuits send signals toward the brain. So images from around us do not travel from the eyes to the brain, only news of discrepancies regarding what the brain expects. Pretty intriguing stuff. I'm not sure if that's exactly what Ramana Maharshi is referring to when he says the visual does not exist, but I think it's something like that. I think it's the, the idea that we can't... A lot of science is built on the idea that we can absolutely trust our senses, particularly vision, but also other senses come into play too. And I'm not trying to be anti-science, but I think what Carlo Rovelli understands as a scientist is that science is built on a kind of shaky foundation if its foundation is what is observed. So we've got this kind of mysterious world we're living in that can't be defined in any ultimate way. And I particularly like the way he brings into the idea that everything is relational, which is also another bit uh, which Buddhism has been saying for a couple of thousand years, and I, I do appreciate the fact that for once a scientist is admitting, uh, as I mentioned in that chapter on Nagarjuna, that the Eastern uh, philosophers have been way ahead of us, uh, Westerners, in a lot of ways for a lot of years, which is something I felt uh, for a long time. It's one of the reasons when I originally started studying Western philosophy, I was like, oh, this is really disappointing. I want to get to the Eastern philosophy because these guys are much deeper. But there's a tendency, a kind of prejudice among Western philosophies, philosophers that still exists to sort of poo-poo Eastern philosophy as a bunch of sort of mumbo-jumbo voodoo. And, uh, and I think that's a huge mistake, and I'm, I'm glad to see it being corrected. So, you know, all in all, I highly recommend this book. You know, if I'm going to tell you what to read, it's probably already a New York Times bestseller, so it doesn't need any uh, help from me to, to sell copies. But I, I think it's really good that it's out there and that it's saying something that needs to be said and that it's not yet one of these sort of uh, what the bleep do we know kind of things where they, you know, try to turn everything into into fuzzy illogic and, and silliness. Uh, it's really uh, it's solid scientific stuff. So I, I like that a lot. 
And that's what I wanted to say about Helgoland, and, and I'll let you read the book itself to find out why it's got this weird title. I, I wonder if his publishers were like, Ugh, you sure you want to title it that? Because that's really weird. Nobody's going to know what that means, and, and I'll let you figure out what that means because it kind of gets explained in the first chapter. So you won't have long to wait if you do decide to read the book. So there you go. That's my book review. If you want to send me money to buy more books, you can send money to the, uh, no, you can't send money to the URL you're seeing below, but you can use the URL you're seeing below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. Did I get that right? Because I'm not seeing it on the screen. I'm just remembering where it was on the screen the last time. Uh, so that's hardcorezen.info oops, sorry, hard hardcorezen.info slash donate. Uh, that is where you will find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts, which are my main, 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 mainest ways of making a living, and I really appreciate the donations you send me. Thanks a lot for those uh, of you who continue to donate. Uh, and if you don't want to donate, or you don't feel like it, or you can't donate, don't worry about it. I offer this for free, so you can take it for free. We will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. And remember, achieve your dreams. Hi. Did you enjoy listening to me make that video? Is that interesting to you? Yeah, I know it was. You look very interested. <laughs>